Well, thank you all very much um, for coming, showing interest. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be in a room of gender expansive folk. Uh, I um, want to express appreciation for my team. Uh, some of my members are here. So Charity is here. Brogan is here. New member Mo is here. Um, couldn't do this without you all. I really appreciate you all very much. Um, we're going to talk today about a really expansive topic that has no rules. And it's, it, it's really been a challenge, a fun challenge, but a challenge for me to create a talk around something that has absolutely no rules by its very nature. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of different procedure types, and I'm not, I don't have time and won't be able to describe how each procedure is done. Just so you're aware, we have videos on our website that we've had made that are animated, like what goes where, and this, how is it exactly done, and they're all in this, this thing, my website, genderconfirmation.com, then FTM hyphen, vid hyphen videos, a little bit of an outdated FTM, but slash doesn't work very well, so yeah, FTM hyphen videos. Um, and then... Um, uh, so to discuss, to start to talk about this, we have to wrap our brain around a lot of different things, some of which are very abstract. And we have to talk a little bit about the way the world has been trying to describe these things in order to orient ourselves. And so some people will think of the word non-binary as this sort of an image. So, okay, well, we've got this umbrella category, that's transgender, and we've got two smaller umbrellas that probably live underneath that. There's the binary, and then there's the non-binary. So, kind of we have to scratch our heads and say, okay, is that a good model? Does that describe the world? And we've come from this model, okay? So that's the model that has, to some degree, served some components of humanity for thousands of years, but it's been really, or maybe not thousands of years, but the last maybe since Roman times to present couple thousand years. And, um, and it's really super simplified categories. Everyone knows, you know, obviously this is too cut and dry to, expand, to, to describe anything that's useful to us. So then we try to look at a, maybe a different bit of a, cat a, a way of describing it. Okay, is somebody then on a spectrum, but then there's maybe some concentrations in certain parts of the spectrum, and so we've got maybe a male concentration in that, that left side and the female on the right side. Is that the model for gender? Is that gonna help us wrap our brain, our brain around things and make good decisions? You can see that each kind of stage is getting a little bit more complex, complicated, as, as the more that we uh, the more that we adapt to the way things might really be. And then we say, okay, well, well, within each individual, there's gonna be different gender traits. I don't like organized sports at all. Is that a male or a female trait? I don't know. Uh, but if we assign it on something, then is that on the spectrum? And do we have to plot that out as, as, as a data point? So each individual then gets 100 different gender traits and then those are plotted and then those are superimposed upon one another and then that society, is, is, that, is that the good model for gender? How do, we, how do we wrap our brain around that? And then there is, over the course of time, um, everything will be different. In one moment to the next, you could have your 100 to 100,000 different gender plotted traits and then you might be different in two years from now and, um, and they'd be expressed differently, an entire population dynamic would be different, and pretty soon, if we were to try and plot all of this out, it becomes an incredibly complex, rich, multicolored <coughs> soup of peaks and valleys that is changing at um, an incomprehensible velocity. So uh, if, we, if we get to anything that comes close to a real description of gender diversity, pretty soon you become sort of mind blown, you know, mind expanding. There's, it, it goes beyond our um, ability to define. Um, and and uh, yeah, so I, I'll come back to that, I think a little bit, maybe perhaps in the end. So, and I am, I'm probably in a room of people that have, have gotten really significant educations in gender and have really um, tried to wrap their brain around the subject matter of this slide. And I'm just a, a meandering individual who is curious as to why the world gets so flipped out about this. And I just try and process that. Um, and so I, I, in my own not having done a formal education in this means of trying to figure it out, uh, I look at the world and, and, and where it has come through. And I really kind of am only focusing on Western society because I know, I know that a little bit better than other societies. But from what I can tell, it seems sort of like from the, from the soup of, of tribes and just universal expression and people trying to categorize things, we all honed in on the Greeks and specifically Aristotle trying to categorize things. So people may or may not know that our whole system of categorizing animals 
comes, all the genus and species stuff comes from Aristotle being OCD about trying to name all the animals and all the plants. And then, um, and, but then also tried to categorize absolutely everything. That is how they made sense out of nonsense. That's how societies that were afraid of the, of the dangerous out there would create a sense of cognitive safety is by defining the environment in which they were and, and believing in that definition. Um, the Romans loved the, the Greek thought, so they brought that system of categorization into it. And then eventually the Europeans and the, the, the thing that brought humanity through the Middle Ages, which was the Catholic Church, was hyper-categorized. And so um, without casting any blame on those systems, that's maybe how I begin to understand why people get so flipped out about it. It was humanity's system of categorization was perhaps our defense against a belief that the outside world was going to destroy us if we didn't build something that made sense out of randomness. Um, but then if you, if you try and build something that makes sense, you make it really simple, you put little, two little dots on the screen, male and female, uh, then if you go back to the way things probably really are, and it's this endless soup of waveforms, um, then it no longer makes sense. And uh, I think that it can be very threatening for people to try and bridge that gap, basically. Um, so people do take sides a lot, which is also confusing to me, on uh, binary versus non-binary, and, and which one should we be paying more attention to? And even within the gender community, you know, uh, the, the offensiveness of thought on either category is something that I don't, I don't fully understand. Um, but I, I do like the two terms that are in the bottom. I, I, I don't actually love the term non-binary or gender neutral. They certainly have their use and they're super popular, so I use them a lot. I do like gender expansive more. And then um, Diane Aronsaft, who is super well known in adolescent gender, um, just recently at a, at a conference that I put together, used the words uh, gender infinite or gender infinity, which I really like, but I don't think that society is perhaps ready for that word. Uh, but uh, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's probably my favorite word, um, and maybe in 10 years it'll be something that we use a lot. So um, what, are the, what, are the, what are the things that are already going on? And today I'm going to be talking about top surgery predominantly <laughs> and some body contouring, but just it's really almost a footnote. But then what are the things that are already happening in the world of the binary? So, and some people know all about this and some people don't because I still get these sorts of inquiries on a consultation from time to time. But people say, okay, can I still have top surgery because I'm, I haven't started testosterone yet? And it's really important to know that hormones and surgery, especially for top surgery, are totally independent variables. You absolutely don't have to be taking hormones in order to have top surgery. You can, but you don't have to. In the world of top surgery, you don't have to stop hormones if you're already taking them. Um, but uh, they're definitely not required for top surgery. Um, and then also pronouns are totally independent variables. We focus on the existence of gender dysphoria. We don't care about the actual gender identity. I have plenty of female identifying individuals in my practice that are, were assumed to be female at birth and are still female identifying. And um, they, uh, they have dysphoria of their chest. We perform the procedure and it is just as effective in an individual who is gender neutral identifying or male identifying. Um, so that is not, it's not important what your pronoun is. Um, dysphoria could indicate a different top from a bottom in terms of binary. I've, other, I've had other patients in my practice, and this is the minority, but they're becoming more and more popular, um, where, for example, a, a person assumed to be male at birth uh, was gender neutral. Well, let me, it's more complex than that, but recently had a successful case, assumed to be male at birth, um, was then later uh, determined to be a trans woman, um, started on estrogen, uh, had a vaginoplasty, loved the vaginoplasty, didn't, loved how estrogen made the individual feel, didn't love the chest at all that started to appear. And so we performed a mastectomy and the individual went back to male pronouns and is a man with a vagina uh, with a flat chest and is ridiculously happy with regards to all, the, all of the variables that we can control in gender. So that's, that's real and existing and um, is coming on a little bit more. I've seen two recent consultations for gender neutral people assumed to be male at birth who, um, who, want, who are developing a small amount of breast tissue and don't want to begin binding and um, will, will either use gender neutral or their original male pronoun. So and then in bottom surgery, there are some leading surgeons and there's, I'm on the standards of care committees for surgery 
and for adolescent surgery. Um, and so I know a little bit about the dialogues that are going on for standards of care eight for the, if, if anybody isn't initiated, the WPATH, World Professional Association of Transgender Health, creates the standards of care. We're on seven, eight is being written right now. And so I know about those conversations. And in the bottom surgery, talking to surgeons that are, uh, make, uh, that are putting forth that it's important to um, include gender expansive language within the standards of care are indicating that people are coming for wanting genital nullification, so a urethra on the presence of the genital area, but no vagina and no other, uh, no other gender defining traits at all. Um, and then um, phalloplasty, but being performed as an add-on procedure without doing um, a vaginectomy <coughs> is a procedure which is now being done um, from time to time. As you can imagine, like all of these things, there's waves and there's surgeons that are kind of on the front end of the wave and then there's the middle surgeons and then there's the people that aren't yet on board. And so, uh, but this is definitely being done. And I've, I've met a number of the patients that this has been done on and, and have seen um, the euphoria with their, with their anatomy um, expressed in words to me. So um, to discuss non-binary, what, what is not something, we have to discuss the something at least a little bit. So we're gonna have to begin there, I think. I wanna talk about what has society determined to be as a beautiful breast with the appropriate characteristics of a breast? Um, and then what has society determined to be a, an appropriate male chest? And then um, later on when we talk about body contouring, what are the key components of skeletal, ar skeletal architecture? Why do they form? And what can we not change at all with current technology, really in the hip and pelvis area? And then what happens with the overlying fatty deposits and how far can we go? So in terms of breast aesthetics, um, Somebody, I started to talk about breast aesthetics in a, a recent talk, and somebody asked a really good question, like, where did this come from? Who determined that this is a beautiful breast? So for a moment, I think we need to take a tiny step back for, on that. There have been some really huge studies that have studied thousands of actual photos of breasts in all shapes and sizes and droopy and everything. And, and the results of people that formed opinions on those breasts, men and women, um, the study didn't include any gender neutral individuals, but they, they assess, the, they determine that all breasts can be considered beautiful by all people. It's super eye in the beholder. Having said that, the, in, the internet and Snapchat and pornography, and that's, that has co, that's coalesced on something that is concern, considered to be the aesthetic standard. So there's the real world, how people really look, which is super, super expansive. There's the real world, how people feel about breasts, which is also actually pretty expansive on an individual opinion basis. And then there's how somehow the entire society is coalesced around, well, we're all gonna rally around this as being beautiful, and then that's a completely separate thing. The, the breast aesthetics tends to be more kind of on the third thing, the thing that society has determined to be what's beautiful. And the reason for it is, I think, twofold. One is, when a youthful breast grows symmetrically, and with pretty dense um, breast tissue and with good tight elastic skin, it tends to form a shape, an ideal youthful shape. There's no secret that our society sort of worships youth maybe to its, uh, to its own you know, problematic society-wide health. But um, we worship youth, and this would be maybe the, the nearly perfectly grown youthful breast, and that's why it's determined to be the attractive breast by society. So what does that mean? Well, it means that there is a uniform curvature of the breast for the most part. So if we were to draw like a, a use a compass and draw a radius on a person's body, it would be fairly uniform curve. Um, and then the areolas um, are a bit wide, but not, not too wide, not overlapping a huge amount of the front part of the breast. And they're um, fairly uniformly placed within the center of the breast mound, both up, down, and right, left. Um, I think we got that. And then also there is um, a, a fair amount of fullness in the upper inner and lower inner breast area. And then as seen from the side, another important component of like what's considered to be an aesthetic breast would be um, a gentle curvature, not, not scalloped out and convex, concave, but maybe a straight line or very gently convex and then a very strong convexity in the lower breast. Excuse me, we're gonna come back to this strong convex convexity in the lower breast when we talk about the difference between um, a top surgery that dramatically reduces the breast and a breast reduction that makes it smaller but keeps this overall shape. So that's gonna be an important differentiation that we're gonna make together. 
Um, so I think I did already discuss this. Um, great. So we said research has determined really that um, there is no absolute ideal. Uh, so we, we got to keep in our headspace, like, what is society saying is ideal? Okay, that's somewhat important, but then also keep in your headspace, that is not reality. Okay, we got to be somewhere in the middle. Um, so in terms of the um, binary male, again, we're going to define non-binary by first trying to define what the society is determined to be binary. And this, again, is an ideal because when a youthful individual, healthy with low body fat content, gets super fit and athletic as they go through and complete puberty, they tend to look sort of something like something. And because our society worships that, that sort of becomes the ideal. And so this is a, a idealized uh, male physique with very low body fat content, considerable muscularity. And what we see is we see wider set areolas. The areolas tend to be about 22 millimeters in size. That happens to be this exact same size as a nickel. So if anyone's ever wondering whether or not they want a binary areola size, and most, most do, even gender expansive individuals usually will want an areola that's about the binary size. You put a nickel on your chest. If you feel euphoria about that, great. If you feel dysphoria, um, and that's how a lot of this stuff goes. You, you can choose a quarter, which is 26 millimeters. Um, if, you, uh, if you get to 30 millimeters and more, it starts to become more of a female appearing thing. And so most people who are gender expansive will stay below 30 millimeters in terms of nipple uh, areola diameter. The areolas are appear lower on the chest and they appear further outward as the chest becomes more muscular. It's sort of just a three-dimensional visual thing. If you have something on a flat surface, it looks like it's sort of closer inward. And as that flat surface becomes inflated, it inflates it outward and downward. So that just the placement of the areolas outward and downward can kind of recapitulate some of that subconscious male appearance. And then um, minimal and uniform subcutaneous uh, tissue, meaning fat, throughout the trunk. And then um, there's a trapezoidal shape so we, we call this a curvature, and it is a curvature if you really look just at the lower chest, but it's really more of a diagonal, somewhat straight line, and then diagonal up um, if we talk about the ideal male form. Okay, so we've gotten through that, the ideal male form. There's a couple other ways, though, that I, I would like for us to think about non-binary. Um, and patients articulate this to me, and sometimes they art articulate it apologetically. They'll say, I'm looking for a chest, and I don't want to be weird, but something that's prepubescent, but in an adult. And, um, but there is actually a lot, uh, I think there's a lot to that, because if somebody is saying, I don't want something that is binary, I don't want something that has gone through the process of binarization via male hormones. And what did it look like before it went through that process? Well, it looked prepubescent. Um, and so we can talk about it that way, or we can talk about it a different way and say, okay, what are all the variables that we just kind of described regarding maleness of the chest? And how much control do I have over those variables to make them look different? And what resonates with you or what doesn't resonate with you? Okay, so we can hone on on a new ideal and be like, prepubescent is what we're looking for. Or we can go expansive and say, what are all the possibilities? What can we talk about here? What can we do? And so we're gonna do both of those things. It'd be um, pretty quick in both directions. Um, and I think we're going to keep watching my watch because I want to have time for questions because I know there will be questions today. Um, so when we look at a, a youthful chest that hasn't had the in influence of testosterone and what happens before and after, we actually don't see much in terms of pectoralis major muscle curvature at all, really on either of the sides. Maybe there's a little bit of one here, but that really defines kind of something of what some people would consider to be a non-binary appearance. Um, and, and I also would almost like to come up with a new phrase. I don't know what the phrase would be, but there might be like, for appearance, it might be like non-binary and then maybe anti-binary. And anti-binary would be really totally outside of the realm, but then, or maybe pre-binary would be a way of describing it. I don't know what the right thing is because you're gonna get exclusionary and so, but, but I would like to begin to talk about things in terms of like really expansive versus pre-testosterone um, pre exposure. Um, and then, um, if we compare the two, it's pretty dramatically different. You know, even if we've blown this one up to a similar size. So the areolas are, are, are small. There's very little muscle sort of shape here. Um, the position of the nipples appears to be outer and further downward, partly because it's accentuated because of the new structure of the muscle. 
And one thing that's kind of nice about this, actually, is that a lot of patients have a lot of control over the binarization of their chest. Because if you simply don't work your chest out very much, now testosterone will have its influence, so there is that. Um, and that's not something we can roll back in terms of muscle, really, like we can, roll it, we can roll it estrogens back in terms of removal of breast tissue. But if you develop a muscular chest, that's sort of, um, it'll get smaller if you go off testosterone, but probably not pre-development size. But if somebody wants to, a lot, of, a lot of people say, I want the binary result, not knowing that there's not that many things that I do that will impart an ultra-binary result or a, or a non-binary result just in terms of tissue removal. I'm not sculpting the leftover fat and breast tissue to look like muscle because it wouldn't hold up very well. We'd be five or 10 years in and that previously looking like a muscle thing would be sagging and hanging in a funny way. So I basically am trying to leave everybody with about the same amount of pinchable tissue across their entire chest that, it, that would just be uniform. And if they want to convert that into a binary chest with muscularity and gym time and leaning out and eating chicken breasts and nothing else, <laughs> which is great, I could never do it myself, uh, <laughs> ever. But, um, if, they, but if, if you can do it and you want to do it, you can, turn, you can turn that into what would be considered a classic mus male musculature. Um, so um, there are non-binary results that simply just lack musculature. So this is a, not, this is a peri result of mine, not intentionally non-binary, just a peri result on somebody that had just a very, very thin, wispy mus musculature. It's a muscle that could be made into a big muscle, but it just didn't happen to be at the time of surgery. Here's a non-binary double incision result. And there's kind of an interesting feature to this patient. It's really super subtle, but this patient had a bit of a prominent rib here and it still is present here, so it's, you really have to look for it. But if you look at the patient's right side, our left side, there's basically no musculature almost at all there. If you look at this side, there's, it's not muscle actually, but it looks like muscle. It's a little bit of rib here. So this looks a tiny bit more masculine than this side by comparison. And you can just sort of assume that if everything is just as flat as, some, as anybody would be before they worked out, they can choose whether or not they want to turn it into something else. This is from social media from a patient of ours, and you can certainly transform yourself pretty considerably. So a fairly non-binary result in some ways. There's other features of this that are quite binary, placement size of the areolas. But then, you know, after a period of time of working out and commitment to fitness, um, um, then it's certainly there's some transformation that's there. So now let's, let's go the other way. We just went the way of before testosterone, things can look a certain way. Now let's go the other way of what can we change deliberately as a part of surgery and have a bit of a dialogue about that. So there's a number of different things. We can, I just mentioned to you the, the areolar diameter. Once you get into to, um, 25 to 30 millimeters, you're definitely getting into the non-binary category. Above 30 millimeters, you would definitely be gender expansive. A 42 millimeter areola is the areola size that we set areolas at in surgery for cisgender breast reductions. So that's what we industry-wide have said, this is, a, this is a female areola by definition. Um, and so if you get into the 30 to 40 millimeter, especially on a chest that is pretty flat, that doesn't have a lot of three-dimensional space for something to sit on, um, you're going to have you're going to have a very gender expansive appearance. Those and this decision is one that's very difficult, if not impossible, to change. You can expand the areola somewhat with tattooing. In no reasonable way can you contract the areola without considerable downside. So you do want to make the, sure this is correct. And if it takes, you know, either cutting out cardboard circles or using coins in front of a mirror, it's time well spent. Um, you could have areolas in a different location on the chest. We just kind of talked about how subconsciously, if they're lower and outward, it's a little bit more male, and they could be higher and they could be more inward. And, and we have some images that depict that in just a moment. You could not have areolas, that's super common. So double incision with, with no areolas present at all. Um, I've been calling it a blank chest. I don't, I don't, no one has yet given me pushback of that being derogatory. I don't want it to be perceived as derogatory, but I really want to create a dialogue around I don't want skin grafts as my nipples, but I want nipples, so let's pick one of the non-skin graft surgeries and saying, I don't want skin nipple grafts, that's one thing, and I don't want there to be a miscommunication between, 
I don't want nipple grafts, and I want no nipples at all. Give me a blank chest. We really want to be super deliberate about that because it'll be the worst day of my life the first day I come out of the operating room and have had some sort of a weird miscommunication with somebody on what they wanted in that regard. So trying to develop really deliberate language around that. So to me, a blank chest is a chest with no nipples and no areolas because it's really hard to misinterpret that um, as something else. Um, and, then, um, and then chest flatness. So this is a really important topic. We're going to come back to this. I don't think on this one summary slide it's going to be doing it justice. So we'll come back to that. We've mentioned the lower breast overhang. We'll come back to that. And then the incision. The in incision can be shaped totally differently or also super gender expansive. And we'll come back to that. All right. So we alluded to this previously just a little bit. When we look at these are both. Uh, this is you know a breast overall. It's a small breast. Um, but importantly, in another talk, I talk about this particular angle that I call the infrabreast angle being really important in how we determine what breast, what, what sorry, what chest um, procedure type to choose. And so we won't get into that here, but, in, but we will be using this angle to describe when the angle is an upward angle, no overhang at all of this tissue. It seems to have a very different effect on gender dysphoria than when you have a chest of no matter what size, even a really flat chest, that has some overhang and some, therefore, floppiness of chest tissue. So it seems like there's a real difference in gender dysphoria here. And we need to really be articulate about what we describe as an endpoint if somebody is wanting a non-flat option for size. Because sometimes it's predictable and sometimes it's not predictable that we end up with or without this little bit of overhang. So are there any questions on that? That's an important concept. Overhang versus not. Please. Uh, would that be also affected by being in or loss? It or could. Yeah, the question is, could, would it be affected by weight gain or loss? And it, and it totally could, especially Two, in two ways. It's uncommon for somebody to gain and, and lose a whole bunch of weight after surgery to the point that they destroy their chest results because there's just not that much tissue there, so it doesn't expand that much after surgery. But certainly before surgery, if there's been a lot of weight gain and loss and that skinny elasticity is super damaged um, and we leave some tissue behind and that tissue swells in an envelope that doesn't have good elasticity, when the swelling is gone, it's going to have an unpredictable tendency to overhang. Uh, okay. Great, let's keep going. There will be time for questions afterward also. So then let's talk a little bit. So that's overhang as a concept. That's all I wanted to, yeah, you to have as a takeaway from there. And so what I tried to do, what Charity and I tried to do with these images uh, was, um, first of all, you'll, you'll see light skin and dark skin um, images so that you can kind of get an idea of how things look differently. But also, um, I, I wanted to do these with drawings because it's really hard to mentally filter out what's going on when we're talking about something super subtle like areola size or areola location. So um, that's why we did these with drawings. So areola size variants, and these are pretty su these are pretty subtle, but size are small. Small would tend towards more binary male, medium or fairly large, or even potentially larger. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And honestly, if you look at stuff like this and you're like, I don't care at all, that's fine because it just means it's, it's not a dysphoria trigger for you and probably move on and probably make your decision in the binary, binary category to keep things simple for you. But you'll know, you'll know if you see something and you're like, oh my gosh, especially when we get to some of the later images. Um, and then nipple location. So downwards and outwards, we said, again, associated more with a muscular, more with a male chest. And then upwards and inwards, associated with more femininity. Most people do not opt for an upward and inward nipple position, even non-binary. And most people specifically articulate, I do not want this. Or when they show me photos of what they do and they don't want, they'll say, please don't give me something that's like this. Um, we're assuming that everyone's goals are symmetry, flatness, narrow scars, those sorts of things. So I won't talk about those things. Um, we're, assum we're assuming that everything has to, that has to do with a good result is, is part of what we're going to be striving to achieve. Regarding degree of fullness, so um, when, when someone is just kind of mildly full after surgery, maybe I'll take a kind of tiny bit of a step back. And, and while I said that I wouldn't talk about how the different procedures are done because it's just too much time and out of scope of this talk, there are procedures that might end up in considerable fullness of the chest. There's some people that want that fullness. Most people would be not choosing it for the fullness, but would say, 
it's one of the non-negotiables Dr. Mosser is we have to try to maintain erotic nipple sensation. And I know that we may not, and I get it. It may be numb nipples all around, but we have to still choose the procedure that might make that happen for me. So let's talk about that. And then we have a long dialogue about those procedures because I have a like-dislike relationship with those procedures because they're unpredictable. And as a surgeon, I don't like anything unpredictable, especially if some of the unpredictable stuff ends up in people not being happy. Um, so um, the procedure type that I'm talking about is mainly the buttonhole procedure. It leaves behind some tissue. The tissue is attached to the nipple and the areola. It might or might not roll the dice, end up with erotic nipple sensation, but it might. It truly might. Um, and, um, and the problem is that there will be extra tissue left over for sure. In a lean body, it'll look bigger than in a wider and heavier body because that looks like it belongs to have a little bit more fullness there. And, um, and sometimes the skin doesn't behave as we just, uh, just discussed. If the skin elasticity isn't great, even if you leave a fairly small amount of tissue, you're gonna get some overhang and we'll look at some images of that. And that might be something that would induce dysphoria. Um, so yeah, I, I really want people to think very carefully about the buttonhole. I think people don't, don't give it the respect as a potential adversary that it deserves before choosing it because I've had a number of people say, not a huge number, but 20% or so, that's pretty big, um, say after a year, I had to choose this surgery type, you told me exactly what would happen, I got the result we we're hoping for, I can't believe it, I'm still dysphoric, what do we do now? And so anyway, let's go back to that some other time about um, leaving some tissue behind. But when we talk about it, there is the mildly full where there's some prominence here, kind of looks like what would be called medically male gynecomastia, and, but there's not a whole lot of overhang. And then, then moderately full, still much more prominent, beginning to develop the cone shape and the teardrop shape of a breast, but still no overhang. And then we'll look at some other images later that show a pre-breast reduction result that has clear overhang. Um, so then the incisions, what can we do with those? Well, it's very common, binary or not, for people to want straight incisions or mildly curved incisions, trying to recapitulate the muscle border as much as they can. Almost nobody wants a curved incision that is, a reminiscent, of, that is reminiscent of the breast form. So, and, so, and since we don't really talk about a curve versus a curve, um, a lot of people have a hard time articulating what they want in that regard. But we can make things straight so that there's very little memory of the breast having been there in terms of physical form, or we can try and get a gentle curve if there's a chance that somebody wants to masculinize further, and they're gonna be trying to get that curve to hide within the shadow of the muscle that develops afterward. Another thing is sometimes the incisions need to be joined in the middle, and so um, when they are joined in the middle, Sometimes patients want them to come up just a teeny bit, just like that pectoralis major muscle border, uh, shadow would be coming up a little bit in the middle. Um, again, not a gigantic turning upward uh, re re reminder of the breast. Um, and some people would want for them to be as straight as possible in the middle. And then rarely, not super common, people would want an actual diagonal incision. Um, I think there's a perception that the diagonal incision is a muscle border incision. But the truth of the matter is we're thinking about a two-dimensional palette and there's a diagonal line on like a, what we're thinking of as a flat surface when in fact it's a complex three-dimensional surface with like a trapezoidal shape that only in some photographs looks diagonal. So um, I'm not super thrilled about the diagonal for a binary goal, but for a non-binary goal, of course, if that resonates with somebody, then they can go for it. Um, another example, just different skin color type. And then nipples with, uh, sorry, no nipples, AKA blank chest with incision. Also one can decide the incision type and um, commonly patients are doing this for a number of different reasons. Gender expansive is the most common. Uh, the second most common would be because they wanna have complete executive control over the location of the nipples and they wanna do it with a tattoo artist. And while they're wide awake and while they're mock, doing a mock up before and living with it a day or two and then having the nipples um, inked after that. So, and that's perfectly fine. Um, there are people now doing really, the downside of tap, tattoos, of course, is that like every tattoo with time, it, it um, bleeds and then you have to get it touched up. Um, the upside is executive control. And then there are some people that are doing a really great job with three-dimensional tattoos. You know how if some, peop some people hand draw a glass on a piece of paper just right with a shadow, it looks three-dimensional? Well, they can do that with the shadowing of the areola on tattoos. There's a guy in San Diego 
who is a company called Garnet Tattoo, uh, who does a great job, and there's some other people who are doing that sort of stuff now. And so this is an individual who is smiling for the post op. You can see this big smile. Um, and uh, geez, say geez. Uh, and so this is um, wanted no nipples um, at all. And um, I don't know what percent of people are choosing this, but it's probably about 4 to 5% at this time that are choosing no nipples at all. Probably half are gender expansive, maybe a little more than half, and maybe the remainder are going to tattoo them on themselves. Um, and then another individual who has a lot of beautiful ink on their chest and, um, and opted for no nipples, um, has a, a lot of designs there right now as well. So this is where we then really begin to get expansive. And the, f the fish mouth incision is an incision that kind of the first, or the first creators, describers of it then openly said, we don't like this surgery because we don't like the results that it gives. And I have to even admit, as somebody who's got a traditionally binary programmed mind, I look at this and it's hard for me to see the aesthetics. But there are a lot of people that come into the office and say, nothing really resonated with me until I saw the fish mouth results and I think that's the procedure that I want. The fish mouth procedure um, is an interesting one where we leave kind of like the buttonhole. We leave a, a strip of tissue attached to the nipple from both the upper and the lower part. And again, this is on, I think it's on a video. I think we have a fish mouth video. And then, um, and then what's left behind is an incision straight across the chest, goes around the areola and straight across the chest as well. The incision is nowhere near the muscle border. We're not hoping for a male muscular appearing chest ever or for the incisions to be hidden in that way. But for the patients for whom they do their homework and they really think about this and they really only resonate with this particular post-operative form, they, they tend to be very happy. Um, it does leave tissue behind. So it does have the same potential um, issues that a buttonhole procedure does and should be chosen very carefully. Um, so this is an example, and these are, these are heady scars. I mean, there's a scar right across the chest, has nothing to do with the lower muscle border, which is a bit lower. It's wide around the areola and then goes straight out from the other side. Um, these are hard to revise. Fortunately, they don't need revisions very often, but to do this over again would be a very difficult procedure, and there would be no real chance of moving the scar in any reasonable um, location. So somebody does have to be pretty certain that this is the procedure for them if they're gonna go for the fish mouth procedure. It is a procedure that could end up with, with maintained erotic sensitivity of the nipples as well, just like the buttonhole, and um, to, a, to a good extent, the peri is that way also. So there we have that. Another one, again, these are thick scars. There's something about the central chest in particular that scars more thickly. And so um, there's considerable trade-offs. I really, when patients choose this procedure, want them to look at this. And I really only will hop on board if they look at them and they're like, yep, yeah, I love that. Oh, that's resonating with me. I, that's the one. And so then I'm, then I'm comfortable because those, those, individuals, those individuals tend to be um, uh, very satisfied. So getting back to this other procedure type, the buttonhole slash inverted T that we just talked about, it always, and this is that, this is the breast form that has some overhang. This would be a preoperative kind of mock-up appearance. And then um, the, the post-procedure appearance, there are better results in terms of the buttonhole than this, um, but I want to give something that's somewhat realistic. I tell anyone that chooses the buttonhole, you'd better be prepared for at least a heavy guy's chest appearance, at least that. Maybe enough that there is overhang, so choose carefully. And this would be, I think, kind of a heavier individual or heavier looking chest on a thin individual um, overall, but still no overhang. Um, and then here are some examples of buttonhole and inverted T um, for post-operative results. It becomes a more challenging procedure the longer the breasts, and in plastic surgery that means the distance across the skin between the nipple and up under to the fold. So the longer that distance, two things happen. The more tissue needs to be left behind because more longer the tissue that still is, adhere, is attached to the areola. And then also the longer these teeny little wispy sensory nerves are traveling through the tissue and could easily get sort of dinged. So the less likelihood that we'll maintain sensation. So there's a couple of downsides to having longer um, chest. Um, uh, but some people don't want um, complete flatness. That's something that I was gonna talk about but sort of failed to and that's that 
there's individuals, of course, who, who want gender fluidity to their chest and want to have some tissue left over to where they can on some days present more feminine, on some days present more masculine, but still not have to wear a binder because there's not a lot of overhang. And that's a reality that we would want to pay attention to. And this would be the sort of individual that sort of might be in that category postoperatively. And then this is an inverted T. I actually no longer do this additional scar here that is the inverted T scar. It's the exact same procedure. With scar is called an inverted T. Without scar is called a buttonhole. I virtually never add that scar anymore, but that's somebody in the, a little while ago who did it. Kind of a, it's an interface between an aggressive breast reduction and an and a, um, a inverted T top surgery. But I'm, in my vocabulary these days, I'm now determining to be stating a breast reduction is a smaller breast with still some overhang. So it still has a classic breast appearance of a teardrop shape with a little bit of overhang. And then a non-breast reduction, a top surgery would be this with no overhang but considerably smaller. And then aggressive breast reduction is still some overhang. So, or, or this one doesn't really depict it as well, but I'll, we'll probably redo this image. I'd like for there to be a little bit more overhang there. And then another color, uh, skin color type. So, and, and, and this is something that I want to keep in mind that if somebody chooses the buttonhole type, they might just end up with and not have wanted it. They might end up with a bit of skin overhang, which you don't see in the central chest, but you do see out here. And that may be perfectly euphoric for some people, and it may be dysphoric for others. Um, there is also some considerable shadowing and overhang here, aggressive breast reduction appearance. Certainly things are considerably smaller. For the gender expansive individual, this might be great. For the individual that has really considerable chest dysphoria and is hoping for non-movement and to, to achieve flatness, this could be something that really contributes considerably to dysphoria. So it's important to just look at a lot of stuff, figure out what resonates with you. The, the fortunate thing is the dysphoria triggers are so strong that you'll know immediately what you need to stay away from. Just look at a lot of stuff and pick out some do's and some don'ts images that you'd like to take to your surgeon, um, and, and that will help out a lot. Um, so let's talk a little bit about body contouring, and then um, we're going to have a little bit of time for, or, or, yeah, we have a little bit of time for, for questions and answers. Good. Okay. So um, in terms of body contouring, I want to talk about the bony architecture, and I want to talk about the fat that is distributed overhead. Sorry for this loudness over here. <laughs> uh, it is what it is. Um, so in terms of how things form and why they form this way, so the influence of estrogen on the pelvis is um, the influence of estrogen on the pelvis is, I'm just laughing because it's so, so loud and so cheerful, but I have to be happy for them. I have to be happy for them because it sounds fun. Um, so um, what happens is that in order to, to have a live uneventful birth for both mother and child or parent and child, you have to um, have a wide birth canal that is both this part and it is this part right here. And so what happens during the development, uh, during puberty, with, under the influence of estrogen, is the <coughs> upper parts of the iliac crest go outward, and this gets wide, and this pushes outward, and this gets flat as opposed to like high. And then in this, this angle, this pubic angle, gets wide as well, and that pushes everything outward. Pushes this out, pushes this out, pushes this out. So you end up with a bony architecture of curvature. And we have, there's hugely powerful muscles that plug into here, this whole region here, the front side and the back side, and this, all of your ambulation muscles. And there's no way that we can change that skeletal ar architecture at this time without creating really significant problems of um, morbidity and complications and potential mobility problems. So we're not going to ever go there, at least until we've got better techniques of some sort. Um, and then in the, the androgen-based, testosterone-based development, um, this stuff grows upward, and this grows narrow, and this doesn't go out as wide, so you end up with this boxy appearance here. Obviously, there's no genetic plans for a baby to pass through that area, um, and so it's, de it's designed differently. Um, I think I covered everything there. Yeah. And generally, there's less soft tissue coverage in that region as well. In that region as well, again, estrogen is designing soft tissue coverage to have energy stores for the purpose of pregnancy, and so that stuff is not necessary in the male adult form, genetically speaking. So when you have ideals here, then for um, for female, uh, the, the female ideal, you'll have a tighter waist and a wider um, set of hips. I'm going to speak louder and louder, okay? Uh, <laughs> 
or we'll do a louder cheer maybe. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, in uh, the ideal female form will have a wider, uh, sorry, a narrower waist. Waistline is defined, uh, de defined as the most narrow component of the entire torso, so it's usually right around the belly button region. And then a relatively wide hip, the widest circumference of the hip area. And for some reason, 0 0.7 is considered, actually it's not for some reason, this one we do understand. Seven, 0 0.7 is considered to be the ideal for women in terms of aesthetics, and 0.85 to 0.95 is considered to be more ideal for men. The interesting reason why it's um, ideal and persists through all of human history that we can see, so this is ancient African statues, pre-Columbian figurines, the Renaissance, all the art that has sort of depicted the ideal, is probably because when people are subconsciously selecting mates, they're trying to pick the healthiest mate, and the narrow waistline and wide hips is very healthy in terms of longevity. We all know that truncal obesity is, is associated with some conditions that can be problematic. And then we also know that a wider birth canal now has to do with an increased likelihood of survival of the mother and the, and the baby. So if you have a narrow waist and wide hips, it's, you're more likely to, your genes are more likely to make it into the future. And therefore, there's a programming inside of us for aesthetics that considers that to be desirable. So when we go for, so when we talk about manipulating the aesthetics of gender in, bo in body form, a lot of it is surrounding that, and a lot of it is surrounding the buttocks aesthetics. So let's talk a little bit about um, buttocks aesthetics. I'm going to just skip through this one. So on the back side of the body, there is the underlying bony architecture that we already talked about that has a, a, a point here and a point here and everything's overlaid on top of it, including the fat. Um, and then there's also a fat pad that is here, a fat pad that is here, fat that is here, and fat that is here that is present in much smaller amounts on this, on, in the male side. And also there is um, a shadow that is very, it's subtle, but it's, it's classically male and it immediately sends your subconscious mind into that's more of a male buttock versus that's more of a female buttock. When I do transfeminine body contouring, I'm always hoping to have a, a fair amount of fat that I'm removing from the trunk that I can use as kind of like an artistic medium as fat grafting into the buttocks. And the first place that I go after for transfeminine body contouring is trying to fill in this flatness and make it look like that. If I can do that alone, plus narrowing of the waistline, I can make something look a lot more feminine. And so uh, a non-binary individual that wants to have a, a more feminine presenting um, torso, those would be the things that we would be talking about, waistline and mid-lateral buttock areas. Um, on the other hand, the classic male form is really the lack of those shapes and the diminishing of those shapes. And so uh, we try and not create, um, even if we could create a waistline that's really, really dramatically shaped and formed, we try not to create that. We just are liposuctioning in the, in the masculinization of the body. We're just removing a fair amount of this tissue, not changing the waistline much. We're removing just what's excessive here and what's excessive here. We're trying to make a bit more of a rectangular boxy form. Truth be told, because of the underlying skeletal architecture, which is limiting to us and is something we cannot change, most of the transmasculine body contouring procedures end up in the more neutral sort of a final result. There are not that many that in, in my hands that I can remember where we, we started with a really curvy person and we ended up with you know, the typical triangle. I, I just don't see that as being something that's very likely. An improvement though is quite likely and what individuals are hoping for is, as you all know, is um, not gender misidentification from behind and also being able to wear whatever, whatever clothing that they want. And so those things are generally achievable, um, but body contouring is, is by and large a conversation about more gender neutrality, not a conversation about ex discrete masculinization of the entire torso. So this is kind of a, kind of a, a, maybe what I would say is a common appearance for me for somebody that was assumed to be male at birth and then is um, uh, more trans feminine than their assigned gender. 
Um, so they have some fat in their lower torso and abdomen area and have this kind of, again, typical male buttock. So I just want to show you kind of the difference here. And what I would be doing is performing some liposuction here if I was feminizing a body contouring, placing it there. And the extent to which I do that has to do with the extent to which the, the um, final gender form is going to be visually expressed. This is a, just another kind of an extreme image, but I just want to demonstrate. If anybody ever wonders what, what, what we call the saddlebags in plastic surgery, it's, it's this relative pr prominence of outer hip, outer thigh fullness um, that is very feminizing in body form. I've seen a couple in my entire career of cis male patients that have this fullness and want it removed, but the vast majority are people that have this occur under the um, influence of estrogen during puberty. And if we look along the side, the contour of the body, that tells us a little bit about sort of the gender shape as well. There's this S-shaped curve in the more feminine and then kind of more of a boxy curve in, in the masculine. And again, what would typically be a fairly pre-op appearance here, we would be making this more rectangular if we were making it masculine or really dramatically carving this out with liposuction and then adding fat to this area um, if it was uh, an attempt at feminization one more image of the same. So we did a few um, images here to try and depict some of this, and right after this we're going to get into questions, and I'm looking forward to that. So for somebody that has some curves, some fullness of the saddlebag, inner thighs, outer hip area, and has also a feminine, uh, an estrogen um, defined skeletal architecture, I, you know, I didn't want to show images that are too far out there. I think I, the, the lesson I want everyone to walk away with is we're looking for an improvement and we can achieve an improvement, but we're not typically ending up with, thank you, um, a home run here in terms of extreme masculinization of the torso. This is really a uh, neutralization and a removal of feminine characteristics conversation. Another image here, we're trying to remove kind of these areas of fullness. Uh, that may be a mistake because that may be close closer to the same image. Usually we would have a little bit more flatness in the buttock as, as a result of a masculinization or a defeminization procedure. So um, I think that's almost it. Um, there are these, you know, some of the stuff that we described is in a, a newspaper form, uh, a la Charity, the creativity guru helped put that together. And um, we have a whole bunch of these up here um, at the front. And then um, uh, there's also ways to, to find us and look for us. And I want to kind of leave with one more thought with regards to gender neutrality, which, which um, I just would like to express. And that is that if you, one of the reasons that I really, really appreciate this work and I really appreciate working with gender neutral individuals is that I think it's, I genuinely think that it's like a hugely important hidden source of societal wisdom because I think that I think reality is, this is going to get kind of deep, I, I think reality is, is, is this like super fluid thing. Um, and the minute that we try to, to define it into these categories, uh, that's when we start to get ourselves into tremendous trouble within ourselves and in our interface with the world. And I think that um, I've noticed that the gender neutral patients, well, trans patients overall, but certainly gender expansive individuals who are in this continuous process of self-exploration, there's some of the few people that I think are walking through my, my life and my office that I think are actually kind of seeking the truth, like the truth truth. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that's it. I just wanted to thank you all for, for, for being a part of my practice. Thank you. So I'll, I'll take questions now. We probably have eight or so minutes for questions. And I'm also going to stick around uh, a bit. You know, if the room gets occupied, we'll go outside and we'll keep talking. But please, go ahead. Thank you. Wow. Wow, thank you. Wow. So the question is, what kind of restrictions could be placed on the um, scar placement because your body type? So interestingly, and do you mean my control over where the scar will go? Uh, what, what, what are the potential bodies that limit my ability to put the scars where I want to put them based on it? Uh, 
Ah, got it. Okay. There's actually two, two, two things maybe to talk about here. Um, so heavier bodies, yes, you're more likely to have them join in the center. Top surgery is a skin removal procedure. And if you have overhang and therefore skin that goes to the center of your chest, it needing to be removed requires a touching of those incisions. Also, to prevent or reduce the chance of dog ears, we sometimes chase that extra skin very far onto the back so the incision is longer. Having said that, patients that want a double incision but have very tight skin and um, you know, with, with more skin, I actually can place an incision more likely exactly where I want it to be because it's just extra and I can then work within that. It's not really a creative space, but I'll call it that because I'm not truly creative. I'm working within rules to achieve a result. But within that, within that medium of a lot of skin looseness, I can do, do more. If skin is really tight, it sometimes limits and the incision will go a bit higher. So there's a plus and a minus to having extra skin. Uh, good question, though, and any other questions? And thank you for your kind words, also. Please. What's the likelihood of top scar or top surgery scars keloiding, and is there one that does so less? Yeah, what's the likelihood of top surgery scars keloiding, and is there one that does so less? So, um, the tr a true keloid is very rare. In the world of plastic surgery, a keloid is a scar that invades healthy tissue, almost like a disease. That's very uncommon. A hypertrophic scar is a thick, ropey scar that most people will call a keloid scar. And that's very um, biological for the most part. If you have a sebaceous skin on your chest, like um, oily, acne-ridden chest, you're more likely to have it. Um, there, there are some ethnicities that seem to have more problems with scars, but I actually don't think it's hypertrophy. I think that it is more just persistent redness. So Asian skin tends to have maybe more like two years worth of redness. Um, I think that um, darker skin types, people tend to associate with hypertrophic scars, but I actually don't see it really in any higher, cate higher category. Um, and then um, the, are there some procedure types that will not have hypertrophic scars? No, but some procedure types, if someone's a candidate for them, will have smaller scars, and therefore the hypertrophy would be um, more minimum. So we've got five more minutes, and um, please. Yeah, good question. So um, for body contouring, do you need to maintain it with fitness or could it reverse itself? So uh, again, a little bit of a complex answer to that. The first answer is um, hopefully, this is, a, this is maybe an argument for waiting is that a lot of people enjoy their bodies more after top surgery and then they get fitter and then they wouldn't need body contouring to a significant degree. A number of my patients have had that happen. So if that's open to somebody, I would probably recommend that they go that route first. Um, and it's true of all body contouring, as we say in plastic surgery, you can eat your way around a liposuction, no problem, and they'll, you'll be back you know, in a problematic space. All of the areas that we're doing liposuction on are areas that your body has said, I want to use this spot for fat storage. So if you gain 100 pounds, the body will say, whatever's left over, it'll say, yeah, let's put it right there. That's where we store our fat. So it would come back if you really sort of uh, got out of control and, and had a bad lifestyle and and gained a lot of weight, um, but no, none of us really want that. So we think of all this stuff as an investment. Um, get yourself to a lifestyle that makes sense for you long term and then have your body contouring there and then stay there and it will persist at that point. Yeah, go ahead. No, it really wouldn't. Um, but just a, a quick word that um, for any real deal, really removing a lot of tissue top surgery, chest feeding is not a realistic possibility. You didn't ask about that, but you asked about um, if pregnancy would have a problem for, tops, for, for changing a top surgery result. No more than um, weight gain and loss would. And if you remember, we're talking about maybe more of a double incision or like not a lot of tissue left behind type of a technique. What I mentioned was everywhere on your torso, you should be able to pinch about the same stuff. And that means everywhere on your torso would be affected the same amount with the weight gain and weight loss of pregnancy. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so if, if skin isn't very elastic, you generally want to go for the most powerful procedure, which is a word I haven't used yet but should have. Double incision is by far the most powerful procedure. And in skilled hands, you can get almost anything tight. So I wouldn't worry too much about the ability to get a good result. I would just say procedure selection is really important. Even if skin elasticity is a disaster and you've lost 350 pounds from 500 pounds, you can still get a, a tight chest by choosing the right surgery. I know there's lots of questions, and I will stick around afterward. Please go ahead. That's a great question. So they do, but it's over a very long period of time, and it's also variable. So since gender dysphoria is such a real here and now thing, I tend to say, get the show on the road without caring much about hormones. The old thinking in gender was like, well, we gotta give you know, 10 years for hormones to work, but then there's this person living with a huge amount of their bandwidth occupied with dysphoria that is not freed up. And so I think we just get people what they need done, and yeah, that's, there's gonna be a benefit. I certainly have seen trans ladies that have been on estrogen for 20 years with huge, beautiful breasts. It does happen. Um, but, and, and then body contour is you know, simil similar. I don't know how much really, we're all done, oh, one minute. Um, I don't know how much really significant estrogen-based fat deposits would, um, would disappear with testosterone. There's, I would say only moderately, probably at best over a long period of time. Maybe one more quick question and then that'll be it. Please, I know there's, I'll talk to you afterward. I keep seeing your hand coming up, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, please, go right ahead. Yeah, it's another elasticity thing. You know, again, binding helps with dysphoria. It just is, it's a necessary evil to get you where you need, where you need to go. And so I don't tell people don't bind, you know, just do what you gotta do and we'll deal with the skin elasticity when you come and see me and we'll make good decisions at that point. So I think that's it, but I will be here, okay, for just a little bit. Thanks, okay.